uh, very much, Amanda. I'm delighted to be here. You know, it was in the early 1980s, um, my brother Bob, who was uh, a banking executive, was the CIO at Citibank in Toronto, uh, became a, a director of the Canadian Payments Association. He used to go to these board meetings. And I, and I said at the time, payments, man, that's got to be a real sleeper. And he said, no, actually, these are the most exciting meetings that I go to. And payments is at the foundation of our economy and of wealth creation and prosperity. And uh, so I've long been interested in this topic. And today, I've got 40 minutes to convince you of the following proposition, that the Canadian financial institutions, along with fintech entrepreneurs, with support of governments at all levels, have an opportunity to fundamentally reinvent the payment system, and more broadly, banking, and to be the global leader in doing that. And if we do that, this will make uh, Canada, and in particular this area around Toronto, a global hub of innovation, and of jobs, and of prosperity. And the stakes are very, very high in doing this. So let me get into it. Where were you in September of 2008? I'll tell you where I was. The day after Lehman Brothers fell, I was the keynote speaker at Cybos, and I was looking, at, uh, this is in Vienna, and I was looking out over 7,000 bankers who were sort of deer in the headlights, wondering, what's going to happen to the world. And arguably, the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down the global, not just banking system, but almost brought down capitalism. Canadian banks were relatively immune. And I was talking to uh, Gordon Nixon sometime after that, who was then the CEO of RBC, and I said, boy, you must be pretty proud of yourself. And he said, no, actually, Don, the structure of the mortgage market is totally different in Canada. We have a regulatory environment that works better than in the US, and we it just kept us out of trouble. So it's this good combination of business and government. I tell business leaders, business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And that created the conditions for Canada to become much stronger in global banking. RBC went from number 22 in assets, North America, to number five, sometimes number four. So on the other hand, a lot of people are coming out of 2008 were wondering, well, what do we do? I mean, how do we change the system so that it's more robust and it's more resilient and so that integrity is baked into the system and we won't lose trust again? Well, there are all kinds of theories about how to do this, but I think one of the key drivers, may, maybe the most important driver, is that we're entering into a new paradigm in technology that enables a whole new set of possibilities and arguably a completely new modus operandi, not just for payments, but for the banking system as a whole. Now, Payments Canada has set out on this very bold uh, program of modernization. And uh, who here is familiar with these eight principles? To uh, most of you, okay. So I'm not gonna go through them all, but they sure are sensible. I mean, we need faster payment moving to real time. We need payments that are enriched with data, and there's ISO standard information now about the kind of information that might flow with a payment. Transparency is a wonderful thing, because sunlight is the best disinfectant for many things, including um, for problems in financial services. I think that this new paradigm in technology that's emerging is going to enable us to achieve these principles, but also a whole new set of opportunities and principles that I'm going to get to in a minute. So let me set this up. We're entering into a fourth industrial revolution. The first was steam, and we mechanized things like shovels and hoes. The second was um, 
was electricity, and that enabled the modern production line. The third was the computer, mainframes, mini computers, PCs, the web, the social, uh, social web, mobility, the mobile web, the cloud, big data, and so on. And now we're entering into a fourth where technology is infusing itself into everything and everybody. So we've got autonomous vehicles. I think they'll dominate the streets of Toronto in 10 years. And if we can get a, a motivation system to get more than one people in a vehicle, which is easy, and also to get these vehicles being electric, we essentially have a virtual mass transit system that costs zero cents per mile rather than a billion dollars per mile, which is how much subways cost. Oh, by the way, freeing up half of the budget of the Toronto Police Force, which is on traffic, to be reinvested into other things. We have drones, robotics, so-called manufacturing 4.0. I just flew in from London, actually. Yesterday, I was speaking at a big event sponsored by Cisco, and it was about the Internet of Things and how the physical world is becoming connected. We're animating the physical world with intelligence and with connectivity. AI and machine learning, of course, is at the center of a lot of this technology is entering into our bodies. We're moving away from this dumb infrastructure of the industrial age to more smart distributed infrastructures and micro power grids. Our physical world is becoming smart and we're connecting everything. Now, I'm convinced that there's another technology that I won't say it's more important than any of these, but it's foundational to all of them. And it will enable all of them to play in the economy and to help us create wealth and prosperity. And you may be surprised to hear me say, but I think it's the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin. It's called the blockchain. Blockchain, not the most sonorous word in the world, but I'm convinced that this technology represents nothing less than the second era of the internet. And it can be at the heart of a new financial system if we do it right and if we time it right. So let me explain that. You know, back in the 1980s, uh, when I was collaborating um, with my brother Bob, I was working on this thing that uh, we called the ARPANET. And we had this view that everyone would be connected, by, and everyone would use a computer. I wrote a book about that in 1981. Uh, my mother bought most of the copies of that book. It was sort of like a study in bad timing. But we argued that computers are not about processing data only. They're becoming a communication tool for information. That was right. However, when I send you some information, a PDF, a PowerPoint, an email, I'm actually sending you a copy. I'm not sending you the information. Even with a website, I keep the original. That works great for information. But when it comes to the things that the people in this room care about, assets, things of value to somebody, things like money, or stocks, or bonds, or, or contracts, or loyalty points, or intellectual property, art, music, votes, even things like carbon credits, uh, our identities. Sending a copy is a terrible idea. If I send Amanda $100, it's really important that I don't still have the money. Okay? Now, cryptographers have called this the double spend problem for a long time. And the way that we manage this problem in our economy is through large intermediaries. And overall, they've done a pretty good job. But there are growing problems that need addressing. Uh, to begin, these intermediaries, governments, banks, credit card uh, companies, big social media companies, they use traditional server technology, and all of it can be hacked. JP Morgan, Home Depot, even the CIA found that out the hard way. They slow things down. One of the principles in Payments Canada was easier cross-border payments. It's kind of weird to think about the concept, really. We don't have cross-border email, you know, but we, we have this thing called cross-border 
payments. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, they tax the system too much, given the technology we have today. It can cost 15, 20% to send money from one country to another. They exclude a couple of billion people from the global economy. Now, in fairness to the banks, it's not just because these people don't have enough money for a bank account. They also, uh, many of them, don't have an identity. But overall, these big institutions, you think about Facebook and so on, are capturing our data. This is, the, according to the penultimate issue of The Economist, the biggest asset class ever. We create it, they get to keep it and monetize it. We can't use it to plan our lives. And our privacy is being undermined. So there are growing problems. Um, and 2008 pointed to them as well. What if? What if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast global distributed ledger or database, kind of like a spreadsheet, where anything of value from money to music to votes to uh, intellectual property to stocks could be stored, transacted, moved around, cleared, um, settled, recorded, managed in a secure and private way. What if there were a native digital medium for value, where value could be communicated peer to peer? Well, in 2008, this anonymous person named Satoshi Nakamoto, persons, wrote a paper outlining a new protocol for a kind of digital crypto cash called Bitcoin. And I have to tell you, it took me a little longer than it should have to figure out what the real pony is here. It's, you know, everyone thought, well, Bitcoin, that's cool. Goes up or down in value. Maybe we should speculate. What's the, if you're a speculator, by all means, do that. More interestingly, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. And that has a number of interesting use cases. But the real opportunity here is the underlying technology of distributed ledgers or blockchain. Now, for the first time in human history, people can transact and they can do business and trust each other peer to peer. And trust is not achieved by a powerful institution. It's achieved by cryptography, by collaboration, and by some clever code. And I'm not suggesting here that intermediaries will go away, but they have an opportunity to use this technology to radically change not just their metabolism and cost and operation and so on, but to change the kind of value that they can create. Now, at this point, everyone's always saying, well, <laughs> just a sec, Don, how can this possibly be? How can you trust people without an intermediary, people you don't even know? You know, Mark Twain, he, he said, uh, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter. It's taken me, uh, or I didn't have time to write a short letter. So uh, it's taken me three years to be able to say what I'm going to say to you in two minutes, OK? I've been working on this for three years, so set, set your timers. Here we go. That $100 that I sent to Amanda is broadcast out. And I'm going to use a Bitcoin blockchain as an example. Is broadcast out to a vast network of millions of computers, each using the highest level of cryptography. And all around the world is a group of people called miners, not young people, like gold miners. And they have massing compute of resources, estimated to be 20 to 100 times bigger than all of Google's resources in the world. And these miners do a lot of work to find out the truth. And they compete to validate that transaction. And every 10 minutes, kind of like the heartbeat of a network, a block gets created, and that block contains all of the transactions from the last 10 minutes. The fact that I paid Amanda, the fact that uh, somebody could be sold a house, somebody voted, someone moved a stock, um, some deed was transferred. Ultimately, from my talk yesterday, that some electrical light bulb bought some power from a distributed source and because the bulb paid for the power, its reputation as a trustworthy device was enhanced. And then the miners compete to validate this 
using their computing power in the winning miners gets paid some of the cryptocurrency from that blockchain. And then this is the important part. The block is linked to the previous block and the previous block to create a chain of blocks. And kind of like a digital wax seal between the blocks. And no block is valid unless it references the previous block. So if I wanted to take that $100 that I paid to Amanda and to pay somebody else, I'd have to hack that block plus the entire history of blocks on the, that chain, the entire history of commerce, not just on one computer using the highest level of cryptography, which is tough, but across millions of computers all simultaneously while the most powerful computing resource in the world is watching me. Now I'm not going to say this is unhackable, but it's infinitely more secure than the kind of computing systems we have in our banks today. The way I like to think of it is this is a highly processed thing. Think of a chicken McNugget. To hack that, I would have to take that chicken McNugget and turn it back into a chicken. Now, someone's going to be able to do that someday, but for now, it's tough. So, a chain of blocks. Now, of course, the Bitcoin blockchain is only one. It's the largest right now, but I don't think it's going to merge as the most important. There are others that are very exciting. Hyperledger, driven by IBM, and um, largely but a bunch of other companies, dozens of other companies, um, has, uh, is building a platform for blockchains for industrial strength type applications. Ethereum, uh, the, uh, the consensus conference, I think is ending uh, today in New York. Is it, uh, or, yeah, 5,000 5, people talking about blockchain. And the buzz is all about Ethereum. Uh, because Ethereum, created by a 19-year-old high school student in Toronto, is a blockchain that is not only has a currency, but enables the development of applications, smart contracts, for example. These are just like what they sound like, a contract a agreement between people or institutions that self-executes and that has a payment system in the contract. On the Ethereum platform today are hundreds of projects. Any one of them will completely re revolutionize an industry. And R3 getting to a whole bunch of financial institutions largely, it's a company, but embracing all of these institutions to fund the creation of a new transactional platform for banking. And last week, Ripple announced that it's addressed the big problem with blockchains, which is transaction speed. So the hype cycle is naturally uh, getting pretty hot, uh, the, the economist did a cover story called The Trust Machine, the great chain of being sure about things. I compared this to the first era of the internet. The Economist was more hyperbolic. They compared blockchain to the creation of double entry accounting, which was the foundation of capitalism and the corporation. And now you got Dilbert involved, so you know we're in trouble. Uh, I think we should build a blockchain, uh-oh. Does he understand what he said, or is something he saw in a trade magazine ad? So Dilbert says, what color do you want your blockchain? I think mauve has the most RAM, says the manager. So clearly, you know who you are on this screen, <laughs> which one of you do? And the manager is clearly wrong, because everyone knows that chartreuse has the most RAM. I mean, <laughs> hello. So several years ago, I started working with my son, Alex, who was an investment banker and a technologist. And uh, we launched a dozen projects, and it resulted in this book. And thank you, Amanda, for the kind words about the book. Um, it's, it's now a bestseller in eight languages, and it's being published all around the, uh, the world. It's a big book about blockchain. Uh, in some countries, it got to number two of all books, including fiction and help books and paperbacks and so on. It never did get to number one. Damn you, Harry Potter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, and I see that P Payments Canada has bought copies for all of you, or most of you. So they, this organization is showing great wisdom, because the way to buy this book is in massive volume. Um, 
Christmas is not that far away. I know some of you have friends. No, seriously, um, we're very proud of the book. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why this could get derailed. And a uh, big one, these are all the arguments that, that people raise. And we discuss every one of these in detail in the book. And uh, what we did is we said, we're going to put every one of these in one of two buckets. Bucket number one, the reason why this is a bad idea and we shouldn't do it. Bucket number two, implementation challenges. And all of these end up in bucket number two. Take the issue of transaction volume. You know, I remember, this is 1993, all over again. And I remember in 1993, 1994, people would say, come on, Don, the World Wide Web? I don't think so. It takes three minutes for a website to load on my dial-up screen. And I used to say, that's an implementation problem, you know? That's going to get fixed. And all of these will get fixed, too. So let's go back to Payments Canada and these modernization principles. I think they're terrific, and I think that this technology is, over time, will be the best platform to be able to achieve all of these. But let me suggest it might achieve a bunch of other objectives, too. So first of all, we're going to need micropayments of millionths of a cent. Uh, for example, music. Imogen Heap puts her music on a blockchain platform, and the music is in a smart contract that specifies her intellectual property rights. And if you listen to the song, it costs you a few micro cents. If you put your song in a movie, that's different. And the song acts as a business defending your rights and collecting royalties from the producer of the movie. We need a transactional platform that's going to do that. Secondly, we need the ability to do peer-to-peer -peer payments. You know, when that light bulb is negotiating with a power source, it shouldn't be going through a central server. It shouldn't, you know, with respect to Visa, it shouldn't be going to some Visa system, at least the way they're currently configured. It needs to work in a peer-to-peer -peer way. There'll be tens of billions and soon trillions of these inert objects all communicating with each other. They need to be able to talk to each other and to build trusting relationships with each other for that to work. We need real-time auditing and tracking. You know, the, uh, the, the three-day settlement period. Well, with a blockchain, there is no three-day settlement period because the payment and the settlement is the same activity. I think this is the way to get to real-time with distributed ledger technology. And as for the audit, at the end of the year, I'm meeting with <laughs> the folks in the Auditor General's office and the Treasury Department next week in Ottawa. You know, 14 months later, the Auditor General comes in and finds out all this misappropriate spending. Well, with, with blockchain-based financial operations for a government, let's say, there would be no need for that audit because you have triple entry accounting. You have a debit and a credit, and then automatically a third entry goes onto the ledger. You have real-time auditing. So the Auditor General could catch things real time, as opposed to 14 months later. We need to have anonymous payments. And that's to protect our privacy. That's the way we're going to solve this problem. You know, if you sell me something, in many cases, you don't need to know who I am. What you need to know is to have cryptographic proof that you've been paid. And this is a big problem. I'm going to get to it in a second. Only this technology can address that. I think that we can have payments that are embedded in all kinds of other tools and applications and smart contracts um, and in autonomous agents that move around on a blockchain. So you think of something like uh, you know, Uber that becomes, we call the book Super, Super Uber, which is basically a distributed app, some smart uh, contracts and autonomous agents on a blockchain. You don't need a $70 billion corporation to do what Uber does. Now, that thing, though, needs to have a payment system built into it because there's tons of transactions, it's not just you paying the driver, but the driver going through a toll or the driver um, uh, 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 getting, um, you know, getting gas or electri electrical power or paying for insurance or all the other things. And ultimately, of course, this will not be drivers. 
in the relatively short term, these will be, the vehicles will be autonomous agents moving around too. We need ledger technology to do that. This technology is going to be more secure, and I've made that point. For the first time, we can have a single version of the troops, because there's a single ledger. Bob used to call this back in the days, um, uh, uh, in the 80s, he used to say, people will come and they will present dueling spreadsheets to me. They will all have a spreadsheet that shows what the truth is. And I have to figure out which of these spreadsheets is the truth. And he was the first person I ever heard this term, the si a single version of the truth from. We can achieve that now. And of course, the instant settlement. So this is a big opportunity. I'm not saying it's easy, but this is the architecture of the future of payments. Now, I'm going to skip over with that because I want to get to my uh, final point here, which is, as Amanda said, this is not just about payments. It's about the financial services industry as a whole, and it's also about the transformation of our institutions and of our economy. Does anyone know what this machine is called? It has a name. It's called a Rube Goldberg machine. Rube, yeah, you know. Rube Goldberg was this American cartoonist and engineer who developed all these super complicated, ridiculously complex machines that did something really simple like crack an egg or open a door. I look at this, and with respect uh, to our financial services leaders, I see the banking industry right here. I mean, honestly. You know, you. you, you tap your card or do some kind of transaction and three days later, <laughs> you know, the, after messages have gone through, I don't know, half a dozen different companies, some of them using 1980s uh, or 70s mainframes, each with a counterparty risk, and that was the key in 2008, right, is, is the failure of these counterparties. And then a few days later, a, trans or a settlement occurs. Or in some cases, if it's a stock or a bond, even all this stuff is digital, it's a few days, or sorry, weeks later that a settlement occurs, money moving across the street in Toronto in a digital form. Well, how could we reinvent the entire industry? Well, we spent some time thinking about it. Well, what is it that this machine does? Actually, if you look at the entire industry, it does eight things. One is that it authenticates and attests to value. Who, who are you, and uh, are you really who you say you are, and is, is this really a dollar? They transfer value, and uh, Dave Mackay says, because we move money, we get to store money, and because we store money, we get to lend money. They exchange value, stock exchanges, various kinds of markets. They fund and invest value, venture capital, mutual funds, hedge funds, you know, private equity and, and so on. They ensure value and they manage risk, and overall they account for and audit for value. Well, every one of these, on the downside, in theory, can be replaced by this technology. It won't be, of course. Every one of them can be fundamentally transformed. So let's just take a quick tour through these eight things. Authenticate and attest to value. Identity is a big issue and it's becoming a bigger issue. And our identities are basically these vast pools of data about each of us. So we go through life, we leave this trail of exhaust, of data crumbs, and they get collected into the virtual you. And sorry, Amanda, I'll keep picking on you, but the virtual Amanda may know more about Amanda than she does, because she can't remember where she was a year ago, her exact location, and what she said a year ago, or what transaction she made a year ago. The, the trouble is that the virtual Amanda is not owned by Amanda. It's owned by these big social media companies and other large institutions and intermediaries. Well, what if there was a virtual Amanda in a black box that she owned and controlled? And that this thing was super stingy with her data. So when it made a payment, it would make the payment, but not necessarily even recognize or the, or the, 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 uh, 
person receiving the payment would not ne necessarily know that it's a mandate, just that, that that transaction was compliant and complete. And then this, this virtual person would sweep up all of this data. And not just transactional data, but your detailed health record, your detailed educational record, what your biology 202 uh, prof said about your third uh, essay in your first term, and all of this attested to by the university, so it's valid, but you control it. UHN is already working on this, creating a virtual identity like that. So when you leave the uh, a UHN radiology lab, your x-ray is in your identity before you get out of the hospital, and you have access to it. So this is a pretty exciting idea, and no more FICO, because you are your FICO score. These are verifiable identities that are crypto secured. You know about secure key, a way of ensuring that identity uh, is, is valid. How do these two billion people in the world who don't have uh, access to the financial systems, we can now bring them in. All they need is a mobile phone. And most of them have one or are getting one in the next year. And they can be part of the global financial system. 70% of the people in the developing world that own land have an unenforceable title, a flaky title. So this can be fixed now, um, as we can have identities on a mobile device that ensures that a land title is, is cryptographically insured on a blockchain. Transferring value. Um, I think Payments Canada is right at the heart of this. And it's not just, yeah, we're modernizing the payment system. This is so fundamental for all of these competitors to come together and to cooperate in their common self-interest. And I think the more and more of this payments apparatus we place into a commons where we share and cooperate, the more a rising tide will lift all boats. And other industries are doing this. Number three, transferring value. Um, or sorry, uh, storing value. I think the traditional savings accounts are probably going to disappear uh, because this new platform, it's not just for transacting value, it's also a store of value. Lending value, we've had these things like Lending Club that have been around for a long time, and they haven't really gone anywhere because they have high fees, uh, there's some risk, uh, they keep all your data, and in many cases, they're just a front end to offload a lend to some uh, loan to some traditional institution. Well, collaborative lending is now taking off. I know Alex is speaking in a, 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 a conference called Lendit in China in July, and they have 4,000 people that are reg registered for that. And the whole thing is about collaborative lending based on a blockchain. Now, China's huge into this. Government of Hangzhou is investing a billion dollars into blockchain platforms to try and beat Toronto <laughs> in uh, moving forward. Toronto's the other main candidate. Um, so exchanging value. We've got all these players, right? Brokers, exchanges, transfer agents. So if transactions of any kind could clear and settle, um, uh, instantly, we'd have uh, no more hours of service and we'd have a real-time global exchange, which would, which would be extraordinary. Um, I'll just tell you a quick story. NASDAQ uh, sponsored our uh, book launch in New York and the room was full, it was very exciting. A couple of people said, well, stock exchange are gonna go away, they'll just become peer-to-peer. -peer. And at the end, the executive of NASDAQ gets up and he says, Thank you for coming. Uh, you're probably wondering why we were enthusiastic about this book. Um, and he says, actually, we're not a stock market company. We're a technology company, and we know how to make markets. So we view this as a strategic opportunity to enter into all kinds of new businesses. Let us show you one. They bring out a live demonstration of a NASDAQ distributed micro power grid with a solar panel, sun shines on the solar panel, Power gets generated, and we sat there watching a cryptocurrency come onto this guy's computer, the more the sun shone on the, the solar panel. An example of financial services companies thinking strategically, not just that this is an opportunity to save money or rationalize the system, it's an opportunity to create all kinds of new value. Funding and investing. 
there will be more money raised through ICOs and through crowdfunding for investments in blockchain uh, this year than there will be through traditional venture capital. So I think venture capital will be unrecognizable, not in a decade, but in five years. Um, insurer and, and managers. Right now, it's pretty, if you're head of an insurance company, actuarial science is pretty primitive when you think about it, that you go into the doctor and they, they take a whole bunch of measurements and then 10 years later, you're still getting insurance. What if you could do a deal with your insurance company where you're getting real time, uh, me, you're providing them with real time medical information from your internet of things device or whatever in exchange for lower fees. This is a way of managing risk. This is a good news for insurance companies if they would wake up. And the final one is accounting for and auditing for value. I think the heads of the big, the final four, you know, the big audit companies, PwC, Ernst & Young, and so on, if you talk to their CEOs, they understand that their audit business, if not, will disappear, that it's going to change very, very radically. And most of them are pretty cool with that because we can redeploy all of this resource into more higher value things. And besides this, this um, dichotomy between uh, doing consulting and doing audit and the wall that has to exist between them, that's always been a big pain for these industries. So these are profound changes, not just to payments, but to the entire banking system. I think we're also in the early days of a transformation of a corporation as we know it. The reason that we have vertically integrated firms, according to Nobel Prize winning economists, is that the cost of transactions in an open market are greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the firm. And he identified four categories of costs. Blockchain is devastating and will devastate all these classes of transaction costs. And I think that the firm, rather than looking like this um, you know, vertically integrated thing that does everything from soup to nuts has been changing because of technology in 92 and paradigm shift. The boundaries of the corporation have become more porous. We call it the extended enterprise. And then the, the net and the web came out and transaction costs and a market dropped further. Companies like Cisco unbundled. They focused on what they did best and partnered to do the rest was our poem back then and a network business model conferred competitive advantage. Well, where are we going now? I think we're moving into a period of some very profound changes. We can have a new halcyon age of entrepreneurship because little companies in Canada are going to be able to have the capabilities of big companies without the main liabilities. And talent won't just be inside, it can be outside. Um, exhibit an example. Who's heard of the Distributed Autonomous Organization? Anybody here? Okay. In the book, we hypothesize that we could create a whole new model of the firm. It'd be a, a blockchain that would have some autonomous agents and smart contracts, and it wouldn't need to have a CEO or management or even people. And we almost didn't publish it because we thought, you know, people are going to think we're just sci-fi you know, fine line between vision and hallucination. Um, but we published this idea of a radical new model of the firm. The week after the book came out, an organization was launched called the Distributed Autonomous Organization. It had no CEO, no management, no people. It was a bunch of app, distributed apps on a blockchain. Its goal was to raise money and invest in blockchain startups. The largest crowdfunding campaign ever held was Ethereum, based here, of $18 million. The DAO raised $163 million. The company with no people. Now, the story is not a happy one. I don't have time to go into it, I'm completely happy, because there was a flaw in one of the smart contracts, and the organizers of this thing decided to give the money back. But just the fact that this could exist, Bob Dylan, there's something going on here, and we don't know what it is. I think we're in the early days of some profound changes to the deep structure and architecture of the firm. So in the book, you're going to read about seven new business models that are shaking the windows and rattling the walls of all kinds of big disruptors. 
big opportunities to change the architecture of government to help with the crisis of legitimacy that's growing all around the Western world uh, with our democratic institutions. More and more young people believe the bumper sticker, don't vote, it only encourages them. And uh, this is a big problem because democracy is the best model of government that I can think of. We can move towards a whole new second era of democracy where we, we have accountability and transparency and a culture of public deliberation and more active citizenship. Imagine politicians coming to office with a smart contract where they don't get paid or funds don't flow and then unless they do what the citizens want as opposed to what their big funders in say Washington want. And there's an historic opportunity to reinvent the central banks. And um, bo both uh, Alex and I are working with central bankers all around the world. Imagine if Canada adopted the digital dollar, a crypto dollar, a fiat currency. Not, 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 just, not, not just digital in the sense of you think, but as a bearer instrument, cash is a bearer instrument. If I'm bearing the cash, I'm the owner. We could create digital cash. And if a central banker wanted to put cash into the economy rather than giving it to a bank that could helicopter copter it where it ought to go. If you want to change the inflation rate, you don't wait three months to find out what's happened. You'd know within a day what people are doing and how that's affecting the economy. Historic opportunities. So let me close with this thought. I think I just described a new paradigm to you. And when you get these, these cause dislocation, conflict. They're nearly always received with coolness. I'm guessing there are many in this room who know what it's like to be received with coolness or worse when you introduce a new paradigm. Vested interests fight against change and leaders of old paradigms have great difficulty embracing the new. How are we going to find leadership for change? Well, um, if you go online and just Google blockchain corridor, you can get a free copy of this report that we did for the federal government. And it explored the idea, could all of this, FinTech, blockchain, global transformation be centered in Toronto? Well, it turns out that's not a crazy idea. It won't be Silicon Valley, this is for the second era of the internet. You got big banks, not 95, but five of them that are various levels of doing pretty exciting stuff. Great, the University of Waterloo, great people. And we, rather than a brain drain, we're now getting a brain gain. Thank you, Donald Trump. Um, there's a great incubation environment. The two biggest incubators in North America are Mars and the DMZ at Ryerson. Ethereum is based in Toronto. We've got these great livable cities, stable governments at all levels. We have the federal government, the Ontario government, the Toronto government, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the UHN, and soon to be announced, uh, a bunch of other major government organizations that are all supporting our Blockchain Research Institute. We're making progress on funding. It was always a big problem. Not just venture, but as a company got to be pretty big, the, you'd have a company drain because they moved to Silicon Valley because they couldn't find, you know, you got $20 million in revenue, you're doing a Series B, it was tough to do in Canada. And we have thought leadership. Um, Canada, Canada and Toronto is a global center for thought leadership on this topic. So I don't have time to go through all this, but we made a bunch of recommendations uh, to the federal government. And we're in various stages of ensuring that these recommendations get implemented. One of the most exciting ones, governments have always resisted having flow through uh, share incentives for uh, taxes to spur R&D growth in technology because when you're investing in oil and gas, somebody buys a drill, you know it's a drill. In technology, what are those people doing? You know, sitting there at computers. Imagine if the federal government had some kind of real-time distributed ledger where they could track real-time every single transaction being spent by a company doing R&D uh, under a tax flow uh, model. This could, this could solve the big dilemma about using these tax tools to stimulate R&D. And Alex and I think this would bring $800 million 
into investment in blockchain and fintech that don't currently exist per year. Um, I'll just uh, close by saying that we've charged ahead and implemented one of these recommendations. We've created the Blockchain Research Institute. It's a $5 million program funded by big companies and some governments. We're exploring financial services very deeply, but also um, a dozen different industries. This is, everyone's doing pilots and implementations. This is a strategic investigation of the impact of this technology. And we're also looking at how it changes the way you manage a company. If you're the CFO, what does triple entry accounting mean for you? If you're the CIO, what does this mean for IT architecture? And uh, we get a ton of other great projects. There are 60 projects in all, and many of them are led by the world's leading thinker on this topic. So we'd encourage you to join um, these companies and others in helping make Canada the center of research into the blockchain fintech revolution. So to close, can we do this? Well, I'm of the view, thank you, <laughs> the lone little voice. <laughs> I'm of the view that the future is not something to be predicted. The future is something to be achieved. We have everything that it takes to do this. All we need is the leadership and the will. And I would encourage you, please, to find that. I'm like, uh, my time is up. Do I have three more minutes to do this? I'll just do it. So, um, consensus is the lack of sustained opposition. Uh, Alex and I have been studying nature to try and learn more about distributed trust. And bees come in swarms, fish come in schools, starlings over the moors of England come in something called a murmuration. And it you know this word murmuration? It stands for the murmuring of the wings of the birds. Starlings are out over a 20 mile radius throughout the day doing their starling thing, and at night they create one of the most spectacular things in nature. The murmuration has a whole number of functions. It's not just for show. It protects the birds. Look on the right of the screen here. That's a hawk. 25 times the size of a starling. A killer of starlings, fierce predator, being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. And scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. There's leadership, but there's no one leader. And when the moment is right, this magic thing happens. Well, is this some kind of fanciful analogy, or could it help us better understand how to change payments, the financial system, and the way that we interact with each other in a society to create wealth and prosperity? This is the trust protocol in nature. Remember I said that trust is not achieved through big central intermediaries, it's achieved through cryptography, collaboration, and clever code. There's some cryptography bu built into this thing and some very clever code and some rules. Don't bump into anybody else. Don't get too far away. The thing is a huge collaboration. There's a big exchange of information about trajectory, danger, food sources, and so on. And the thing has a great interdependence. Now I said to you, business can't succeed in a world that's failing. Well, this thing functions as if the interests of the individual bird are connected to the interests of the murmuration as a whole. And it also has a great integrity that gives the starlings the courage to take on a fierce predator much bigger than they. This is the trust protocol. Now, what is trust? In business, trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. And we need a payment system that is trusted. But also people can interact with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer way and trust each other. Integrity being that you're honest, you're considerate of the interests of the other party, and you're accountable, you abide by your commitments. I think about yesterday the analogy was things. Imagine billions or trillions of things in the physical world communicating peer to peer to better inform us, to keep us safer, to deliver new kinds of value 
to us. We need a trust protocol to do that. And if we could hook ourselves up, Toronto, Canada, and on this planet, with a new transactional platform made of glass and air and cryptography and code, perhaps we could trust each other in new ways. And this new age of distributed trust would be an age where promise is fulfilled and peril is unrequited. And maybe this new uh, world that we're entering will, uh, this smaller world will, that our kids inherit might actually be a better one. So thank you very much. Thank you.